Hi, uh, my name's Rob Lance, and I'm gonna be talking to you today. Today is a good day for me, uh, because I get to brag about some of the awesome work that one of my teams has done. So uh, for the video, shout out to Dr. Clark Moberry, who was our lead data scientist on this effort, and uh, Mike Zander, who was our lead developer. Uh, both supremely talented individuals that did a lot of the work that you're gonna see. Um, so for the purpose of an introduction, hopefully you'll permit me to tell you a quick story about me, um, and that will allow me to give you a kind of an analogy that'll frame some of the stuff I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so I spent 10 years in the US Marines, and during that time I learned a lot of cool stuff, and one of the things I learned about was how to call for air support. And so the way you call for air support is you deliver what's called a nine-line brief that t tells the pilot that you're talking to a lot of different stuff about what you, what you need from him, where you're at, uh, who you are, and so on. And as you might imagine, uh, when you have to call for a nine-line brief or you have to call for air support in a real situation, that can be very stressful. Uh, so fortunately, there's a cheat code. And the cheat code is when you first get on the radio with the pilot, you say, I am not a trained forward air controller. And what that tells the pilot is, hey, this guy on the radio, he maybe might not know everything that he needs to do, uh, so I'm gonna have to step him through that. So that's the cheat code. I am not a trained forward air controller. Now I tell you all of that to, t to say the following thing. I am not a trained computer scientist. Um, the reason I tell you that is because I come to data science from a statistician's point of view. Um, but I think that's okay, because what I'm gonna describe today isn't necessarily a novel implementation of Spark. We didn't do anything crazy. Uh, with how we set up the cluster or really any terribly innovative code in and of itself. But what we did do was take a very novel and interesting idea and gestate it and then from conception to an actual proof of concept that does something really cool. And the reason we were able to do that, it was because of the, uh, the way Spark is implemented and how we were able to use it. So uh, pretty, pretty awesome thing uh, and uh, I'm excited to talk about it. So kind of standard agenda, we're gonna go through an introduction uh, of what kind of framing the problem, every good idea starts with a problem and that's what we'll do. Um, we'll talk about why we, we chose Spark, uh, that's probably obvious to most people in the room but it bears, uh, bears repeating nonetheless. And then I'll describe the idea and how, you know, what it is that we were able to accomplish uh, that we call semantic search uh, and then semantic search engine and then we'll talk briefly about how it performs and then I'll go into uh, you know, way ahead uh, for this proof of concept you know, as we move from research and development to something in a production environment. Okay, so the problem. The problem is that a lot of the world's information, in fact, much of it is in a non-native language or a foreign language. And you know, we started in English for convenience because that's our team, but you know, that's true no matter what language you start from. Um, so you've got lots of different stuff in foreign languages and those foreign languages, um, oftentimes the machine translation is either costly or just doesn't do the trick for you. Um, and human translation is way too costly and those, the assets, the people who can do that, the resources that can do that are very low density. Uh, and those problems just get worse when you deal with technical subjects, um, which is the, the corpus that, or the corpora that we've dealt with so far. Uh, are all kind of academic and technical STEM type uh, subjects. So semantic search aims to get around these problems by moving the translation piece uh, around in the workflow to a place where you're only translating a little bit instead of a whole bunch of stuff. So why do we choose Spark? And again, this is gonna be fairly obvious to most of the folks in the room. I'm not gonna say anything groundbreaking, but it does uh, bear mentioning in my opinion. Uh, so the problem is, you know, we've got a potentially massive corpus, maybe terabytes of data to sh shift through, um, and what we need to do is find things that are going to be relevant, relevant results based on a search query within that corpus, and then rank those things, return the results to the user, and repeat, right? And that can be, uh, that can be daunting to do, certainly it's a distributed computation. And so the reason we chose Spark was because, one, as we move this thing out of research and development to a more production environment, uh, we wanna make sure that the distributed computation, the distributed framework is available and, and out there, and of course, Spark is near ubiquitous uh, in any of the places where we would take this sort of thing. Uh, the second thing is the shallow learning curve really was important for how we went about um, 
performing these operations. So uh, the lead data scientist on this project, when we started this, was, had never really touched Spark. And he went from no, no real experience to now, and, and you know, some Python experience, to you know, very, very competent in doing what we need to do with Spark. Uh, and in fact, he went from Python, now he's writing in Scala as well. And, and again, I attribute that to that shallow learning curve, which has really been critical for how we've gone about, uh, gone about this project. And what we needed to do with the kind of distributed computation and, and where Spark really played kind of in three phases of the application, and I'm gonna blend, I'm gonna talk mostly about the back end, but I will touch on kind of some of the front end of the application uh, as we go through the, through the brief. Um, but, you know, we, there, there are three phases of it that we, we kind of employ a Spark framework. Uh, the first is the pre-computation phase. Um, that's a, uh, it's where we kind of pull in the data, munge it, we resolve the data. Uh, entity resolution, by the way, turns out to be one of Novetta's real strong suits. It's what we're kind of known for. Um, we munge all the data, like I mentioned, we do some uh, natural language processing. That's where a lot of the magic happens there. Uh, just standard TF-IDF bag of words type thing. Um, and I'll get into exactly how that goes. Well, I'll get into where we apply that in a, in a little bit when we get to more description of semantic uh, itself. We do some data validation with Spark as well. So that's pre-compute. Now pre-search, um, we wanted a way with which a user um, could take not only search terms and, and concepts and conceptual search, but also a large, like a seed text of search, and maybe it's even a seed text that's in that foreign language that they're trying to investigate. Um, so we'll, in pre-search, we scrape the seed text, and then we're also trying to build lenses to, to really vector in on what's gonna be the, uh, the really relevant results for that particular query. And then finally, during the actual search, now, in the instance of the application as it exists now, um, we do almost everything pre-compute. Um, so all the distributed computation happens pre-compute, and the only thing that happens at, at actual interface is just a, a lookup of what's already been tagged. Uh, but as we were developing the proof of concept, it was really important to be able to do all this stuff on the fly, and I'll describe that uh, in a little more detail as we move on, but suffice to say that that was really great to enable experimentation in that that kind of virtuous cycle of experiment and learn, experiment and learn, without having to worry about um, you know, wasting resources or having to let something run for a week, we were letting something run for an hour and it was returning relevant results. Um, and then actually, even with on-the-fly computations, we were talking about eventually minutes as, after we optimized that code, which was really awesome. Okay, so what is semantic search? And I'll go through kind of the pre-compute and then the uh, the search and then, or I'm sorry, the pre-search and then the search parts of that. So this is the idea, right? This is the really cool thing that we were able to do, which was take this idea of, well, I've got all this data and information in a foreign language. I wonder if I could leverage a crowdsourced Rosetta Stone in order to conceptualize all that information in a way, in its own language, and then translate those concepts back to the, the searcher's language or the speaker's language. Um, and it turns out that Wikipedia actually is a really good way to go about that. And so what we do in, pre, in the pre-compute stage here is not only do we TF-IDF all, uh, all the corpus, but we also do that with the target languages Wikipedia and the searcher's language Wikipedia. So in this case, we've got two Wikipedia pages. Uh, it's the Hanzi Chinese on the right and the English language uh, page for machine learning on the left. Um, and we don't rely on necessarily a one-to-one -one translation there because what we're trying to get at is how is Chinese machine learning spoken about and how is English machine learning spoken about and characterizing those things such that then we can go to the Chinese language corpus and say, show me the things that are talked about like machine learning in that corpus. And then we can tag that concept uh, to that document. Um, so that's the the basic idea and what we were trying to prove out, and again, you know, Spark was really important for that because as you might imagine, you know, I say, I kind of gloss over TF, IDF, and bag of words, there's a lot of stuff happening there. A lot of that natural language processing is really important and the experimentation with that was extremely important. Okay, so now in pre-search, I mentioned that we wanted to be able to start with some seed text and, and generate concepts out of that. So what we do there, we, it, 
actually doesn't matter as far as the application is concerned whether you start with the target language text or the speaker language, speaker's language text or the searcher's language text. Um, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to parse it and it's going to find those con extract the concepts and then present those back to the user. And this is kind of where the front end comes in. It presents those back to the user, say, so they can got to get a, a self validation on that. You know, I, it, it'll say I was able to pull these concepts out of this. Is this kind of what you're looking for? Um, the nice thing about that is maybe you start with uh, a document that is not in your language, but you, you're highly confident that it's, it's relevant to your search. Well, you can cut and paste the abstract from that document into the, into the application. It'll scrape that, parse it, and get those concepts out of it, and you can then start your search from that. So in this stage, you can kind of confirm those concepts that were pulled, and maybe you can add some others in, or maybe you can delete some out, but really refine that lens search. And then finally, during the search phase, we, we talk about what's, what we call an ontological lens, and that really helps us, or, or helps our users, that is, um, refine those search results um, based on lots of different uh, concepts and terms. So um, in this case, I've got machine learning and healthcare, but maybe you would also want to say, I want, I want specifically artificial intelligence machine learning, or I want unsupervised machine learning, or maybe if I wanted unsupervised, I'd include machine learning, but also clustering methods. Um, and you could do that sort of thing. So we can state those concepts explicitly, or like I said in the previous slide, we could scrape those from unstructured text. Then we go to the, the Wikipedia step there, and that's the Rosetta Stone that we kind of translate through. Um, so we, we compare the, the concepts that we pulled from English to their foreign language counterparts, and then we use those foreign language counterparts Wikipedia text to go into the, the target corpus to pull out those relevant results. Okay, so finally, how does it perform? And with a moderately sized cluster um, and a moderate data set on the order of about 100 gigs of data, uh, we can get those results on the fly to come back in about a minute, maybe two minutes, depending on how the cluster's performing that day. Um, and that's really useful. It, by the time we optimized all that, it, it was really useful to us because, like I said, that enabled us to do the really focus on the, the hard process of the natural language processing that goes underneath the hood of the, you know, both the Wikipedia and the target corpus. And so that's that last statement, kind of the payoff. The abil ab ability to fail fast was really, really important uh, because that, without that kind of experimentation, that the innovation wouldn't have, wouldn't have, would not have come to fruition. Um, and that was really useful to us. So, uh, you know, when our data scientists and developers don't have to worry about wasting resources to have something running for uh, days, um, they're a lot freer to experiment with those, with those resources, and we found that to be a really good and positive thing. So I'll wrap up by saying this, that, you know, um, while this was great and, and, you know, now we've moved actually that to everything is pretty much pre-computed, so we get results back not in minutes but in seconds or, or even sub-second at sub-second returns, uh, that's great. The thing that we're looking really forward to is uh, deploying this in an environment like Databricks, where now we would abstract even away the cluster management um, to give our developers and, and data scientists even more time to focus on the hard problem. So we're really excited about that as a potential future to get that, get that up and running in that kind of environment because then we could just point it to the data and let it do its thing without having to worry about optimizing, you know, optimizing the Spark cluster to, to address a, a specific problem. So with that, I'll, uh, I know that's really fast. Uh, but I'll go ahead and turn it over to questions. Sir. Oh, oh maybe. Uh, uh, hold up. Let me put the <laughs> mic. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just curious here, and then we can go around. Quick question. How do you extract concepts from the text? What algorithm specifically do you use to semantically extract the concepts from the free piece of unstructured text? Um, so we use an ngram ngram search approach, right? So basically looking for, uh, so we have basically all the, all the concepts from the Wikipedia space for both languages. Um, and if a concept exists in Wikipedia, then we can find it in the, in the search text. Um, when I think of semantic search, uh, what comes up for me is um, using ontologies to define concepts 
ontology classes generally have a label. The label is usually in a language, maybe English, maybe through Google Translate you can convert the label to any other language you want. Um, and then annotate your texts with the, the class, the, the concept from the ontology, mm -hmm. and then leverage the ontology structure, that is the, the hierarchy within the class structure of the ontology to um, uh, broaden and or narrow your semantic search <coughs> um, and possibly map concepts across ontologies. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not clear to me that this approach is using that kind of semantic search. Uh, that is a failure of my pages and not of the, of the tool. So we, we definitely do take advantage of the tree structure of the ontology within Wikipedia. So not only, you know, there are concepts um, that are children or parents of other concepts and we, we try to take advantage of that for sure. Uh, and that's a lot of the magic that happens under the hood um, when, we, when we're generating the scoring for determining what's a relevant result. Um, so we, we take advantage of Wikipedia as its own ontology. Um, I'm not familiar with that ontology per se. Can you <coughs> plug and play any ontology you want? Uh, if it were sufficiently dense, yes. But Wikipedia is huge and that's kind of part of the thing that, that allows us to, to do what we do because it, it is so big and, and kind of more or less complete. Oh, um, is that using schema.org? Oh gosh. Um, no, I don't think so, but I'm not going to be able to tell you what it is we do use, and I apologize. Okay. I got the impression it's like data mined somehow. It's data, what's that? Now? Data mined. Like you're just mining the text to pull out concepts. Um, I, I didn't get the impression that there's an ontology there. Well, no. So the ontology comes in the form of Wikipedia, right? So each, each article title is a concept in the ontology, and, the, and then those article titles or those article texts have other articles linked to them, which forms the parent-child relationships in the ontology. Uh, and then the, oh. the text within those is what forms the, yeah. uh, okay, good. Yeah, all right, good, thanks. Yeah, of course. Um, and this should be obvious, but just to make sure, you're saying you used Wikipedia and those translations by humans as your training, right? No translations by humans as training, no sir. Well, so the Wikipedia pages on other languages, that's what I mean. Yeah, so. Which, well, so translation is the wrong word, but you have a page on machine learning in Chinese, traditional Chinese, a page on English. Right. And, and there's a, the an, a mapping link. of those two, because you know that they're the same concept, that was your training yes. corpus. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, hi, I was just wondering if you're familiar with the the Yago three project, which is uh, stands for yet anon another great ontology. It's uh, it's actually built. Well, the Yago two I'm more familiar with. It's English only, but Yago three is multilingual, and they, they did some sort of work where they were com similar to what what you described, I think. Uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with it, but okay. I'm guessing that somebody on my team is. Okay. Um, but thanks very much. Um, yeah, I just say take a look at it. it yeah, for sure. There's some similarities there that look, uh, look interesting. Yeah, thanks very much. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciate your time.